Shall we rise up to pray? A great God in heaven, we thank you for your love. Thank you for bringing us together. Thank you for revealing your mind to us every time we come for the Bible study. We pray, Lord, that tonight will be an enriching, penetrating, powerful Bible study in Jesus' name. I will pray to be so practical, you apply to every one of our lives so we know where we are, where we're going, what we are to be. And your grace will come into our lives to be and to do what you want us to be and to do in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, that these studies will not just pass over our shoulders. I will not just be hearers of the word only, will be doers of the word in Jesus' name. That every step of the way, every day that we live, will show that we have your grace in our lives and that the study of your word is making a right impact in every life in Jesus' name. Once again, Lord, open the eyes of our mind and of our heart, of our spirit, that we may see and behold wondrous and great and transforming things out of your word in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you very much. You can sit down. We're coming to a Bible study tonight and we're looking at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Today we're looking at verses 10, 11, and 12. Open your Bible with me. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 10. Ye are witnesses and God also, how holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. As she know how we exalted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father does his children, that ye would walk worthy of God who has called you unto his kingdom and glory. Here Paul the apostle was speaking to the Thessalonians as a pastor, as their father, and as a nursing mother gentle over those babies, those new converts. He was talking to them as a teacher of the word. He was talking to them as a minister. He had been saying to minister the gospel of grace and the gospel of power and the gospel of God unto them. And first of all, he said that this gospel had been entrusted into his hand. And because he knew the greatness of what was entrusted into his hand, he spoke that word boldly, in a penetrating way, in a pungent way, in a practical way that turned them away from all their idols and turned them unto the Lord. Look at chapter 2, verse 2. But even after we had suffered before and were shamefully entreated, as you know, at Philippi, we were bold. He was telling them that the gospel is nothing to be ashamed of, to be timid about, to be fearful about, to be frightened about. He had a spirit within him, the spirit of the living God that gives inspiration and illumination and power. And he said, because of that, this gospel committed in our hands, into our hands, which were given unto you, were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. And then he said in verse 4, he said, But as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, he said, As a good steward, as a good minister, as a good servant of God, the gospel had been entrusted into his hand. And he knew that every jot and every tittle, every part of that gospel was very important, essential for their salvation, essential for their sanctification, essential for their service, essential for their spirituality, essential for eventually getting them to heaven. And as good stewards of the Lord, as somebody that knew that this gospel is committed into my hand and I must be faithful to every jot and tittle of it, he said, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God, which tries our hearts. 
He said, it, the temptation was there to please men. Men of all kinds of character, of all kinds of behavior. Or oh, good men, and you know, the tendency will be that you want to please those good men. There were gracious people in the congregation, and the tendency will be to want to please those gracious people. But there were some real hard people, tough-minded people, and there were some harsh people. There were some persecutors. He said, on the one side, there were those good people, there were children of God, and pardoned people, there were purified people, there were sanctified people, and the tendency will be to forget God. And then to think that you are to please and to you are to entertain those good, good people. On the other hand, there were sinful people, backsliding people. There were persecuting people that will cause you pain. And to avoid the pain and the persecution, the tendency was to please them. But I said, no, not at all. Neither good men nor bad men, neither sinful men nor saintly men, neither righteous men nor righteous men, who are not going to please anybody because... The gospel has been committed into our hands, and we're doing it and preaching it, proclaiming it not as pleasing men, but God, which tries our hearts. Then he comes to verse 5, and he says, Even you Thessalonians, he said, For neither at any time used we flattering words, as you know, nor a cloak or covetousness, God is witness. Then he said in verse 6, not of, nor of men sought we glory, neither of you, nor yet of others, when we might have been burdened some as the apostles of Christ. Then he began to say about the lifestyle, about their conduct, about their approach as they presented the gospel unto them. First of all, he wanted to tell them, you will remember who are gentle among you. Why? Because we are like nursing mothers. Why? Because we are dear and precious and priceless unto us. Why? Because we are th thinking about your salvation, about your relationship with God, and about your eternal destiny. And because we are thinking about your eternal destiny, we are not thinking about your present convenience, we are not thinking about your present joy, and we are not thinking about your present enjoyment of what we are telling you. We, we look ahead, we think about your future, we think about our future, we think about where you will spend eternity, and we think Think about where we, we will spend eternity because of that consideration of thinking about the future. Our future, your preachers, and your future, the hearers. Because of that, we presented the gospel unto you without fear, without favor. And then he said in verse 8, so being affectionately desirous of you, we well, were willing to have imparted unto you, not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls. He said, we counted every cost and said, we, we said, we're going to pay the price, whatever it will take to get you saved and to get you steadfast and to get you sanctified and to get you spiritual ready for the kingdom of God. We'll do all that and pay all the price because we're willing to even share our very souls because ye were dear and precious and priceless unto us. Then he now says, he wanted them to remember, just recall, throw your mind back to the life we lived when we were with you. He's been talking about all this and also now zero it in. Be, pay, be particular and emphasize the areas of life that they had. Look at verse 10 again. Ye are witnesses. said, I know you are vigilant. I know you are observant. I know you are perceptive. I know you are looking at us and watching everywhere we went. You know our private lives. You know our public lives. And you know when we are with the congregation. You know when we are outside the congregation. And you knew what we do. You are witnesses. But your own witness is even nothing in comparison with the witness of the almighty God. God and God also. That God also was watching us. He was looking at our lives within and without our attitude, our disposition, our heart condition, our lifestyle, internal, inward, and external and outward. God was watching everything. How holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves. Isn't it wonderful that it wasn't only Paul the Apostle, but Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus. That is Paul, Silas, and Timothy. How they behaved in a uniform way. It will be a wonderful thing. Any church of God, when all the ministers will not be accused of anything unholy, anything unrighteous, anything reproachable, 
and it's in dirty and it's in defiling but all of them from the top to the bottom all of them from the greatest the highest to the lowest and to the least paul the apostle and then silas and timothy all of them said that we behaved ourselves among you that believe before we can preach effectively we must practice effectively what we're trying to preach and before we can proclaim and tell the people that here is it here is the gospel and here is the transforming power and the effect of the gospel we must be able to live it out that the people will know the medicine we're recommending for their cure has cured us of our own spiritual disease of our own spiritual sickness and you see that we are living righteously and holily and justly unblameably before them that believe then they'll be able to say hey the grace of god is available he made a person like Saul of tarsus he made him paul and he made him to be able to live a life that shows salvation a life that shows sanctification holiness a life that shows power for service we can chew if the Lord can do it for Timothy, a timid person, a fearful person, always a frightened person, a person that wants to go to a shell whenever there was any problem. If God can make a person like Timothy more than a conqueror, he can do it for us too. That's why he said, recall, remember how we were before you. And then he said in verse 11, as you know, he said, you are not ignorant of that, of the scriptures. You are not ignorant of that, of the servants of God. You are not ignorant of that, of the life we live before you as you know how we exhorted you and how we comforted you and how we charged and challenged you we didn't just say you know we didn't just exhort you and counsel you and admonish you and advise you we charged you it's like we wanted to enforce what we're teaching and we told you here it is take it because it is for your good and we charge every one of you they were not kind of sectionalizing the congregation. I didn't talking tough and talking straight and talking spiritual to one part and then looking at the other side and not talking seriously to them. Every part of the congregation was important. It wasn't a congregation that was half beige on one side and almost well quigged on the other side. But every part, they spoke the word unto them as a father does his children. He said, Tetanian believers, why were we bold before you? Of course, you are children. We are your fathers. Why were we straightforward before you? You are children. We are your fathers. We have your interest at heart. And we have your spiritual gain at heart. And we have your transformation at heart. We looked at the end product, wanted to produce, want to make saints out of the sinners. That's the reason we spoke to you as father talking to the children. That ye would walk worthy of God. That is, you'll walk worthy of the one who sent his only begotten son to die for you. To share this blood for you and to turn your life around and to change you who has called you unto his kingdom and glory. That's what we're looking at today. Exemplary character for an excellent ministry. Obviously, Paul the apostle with Silas and with Timothy, they had an excellent ministry. And their character is what we're looking at today. Paul the apostle, like a pastor, like a teacher to the Thessalonian church, demonstrated a worldly example of Christ-like character that could be followed, that could be emulated. And you know, there are people, I mean, all over the world, there are people that are trying to preach the gospel. They're trying to be ministers. They're trying to be pastors and teachers. But their lives are not worthy of emulation. Their lives are not worthy to be followed. And you cannot just rise up and follow anybody. In fact, the Lord Jesus Christ said, you must not follow a stranger, somebody who is strange to grace. And strange to God, and strange to godliness, and strange to the glory, the power of the gospel. You cannot just say because the preacher I'm following. You look at their lives. Can you witness that they are holy, that they are just? They're the unblameable. You cannot just rise up and follow somebody because he's carrying the Bible, because he says, I'm a preacher, I'm an apostle, and because I am a teacher of the word of God. You cannot just rise up and follow them. 
They didn't know the grace they talk about. They didn't know the God they talk about. They didn't know the godliness they talk about. We're looking at John chapter 10. In John chapter 10, I'm reading from verse 5. John chapter 10, we're looking at verse 5. It says, and a stranger will they not follow. Somebody is strange to the grace of God. Look at this fellow is preaching, is teaching, and is trying to tell us, come to the Lord. But he's a stranger to the grace of God. This one doesn't, doesn't appear to know God. He's a stranger to God. And then he's a stranger to godliness. What they thing that shows that you know God and God has called you. He says a stranger will they not follow, but they will flee from him. For they know not the voice of strangers. We're looking at third John verse 11. The third epistle of John. And we're looking at verse 11. And you'll see what the Lord is telling us. That yes, we need to follow the preacher. We need to follow the pastor. We need to follow the teacher of the word of God. But make sure that that pastor, that preacher, that teacher is not a stranger to God. It's not a stranger to grace. Grace is not a stranger to glory, the glory of the gospel, and it's not a stranger to godliness either. In St. John verse 11, here is what it says, Beloved, follow not that which is evil. The person is evil, don't follow him. The doctrine is evil, don't follow that. The practice is evil, don't emulate that. And the lifestyle is evil, don't follow that. Beloved, follow not that which is evil, for that, but that which is good. He that doeth good is of God. He that doeth evil has not seen God. May talk loud, may talk sweet, may talk and say that it's an apostle, a bishop, an archbishop, whatever. But if he does not live the life holy, just, unblameable, he does not know God, he has not seen God, you don't want to follow such people. And Paul the apostle said, He became followers of us. And of the Lord, for yourselves know how ye ought to follow us. For we behave not ourselves disorderly among you. We wrought with labor and travail night and day to make ourselves an example unto you to follow us. The Thessalonians are a worthy example to follow. I pray you'll be a worthy example. I said you'll be a worthy example. That means you are saved. That means morning, afternoon, and evening, night, you're living the life of a saved soul. That means in the private and in the public, when we're there to see, and when we're not there to see, you're living a life that is holy, a life that is just, a life that is unblameable, then we can follow you. Because it says, Paul the Apostle, as a spiritual leader, he presented exemplary example and virtue of tenacity. That means staying there, top-mindedness in the contention. He said about it, he said that in first sentence, and in the conflict, he stayed there, tenacity, and then he had integrity, he had purity, humility, and then charity, that is love, authority, as well as accountability. In, this, in the second chapter, he uses the most intimate, compelling metaphors of a mother. He said, we are gentle among you as a nursing mother, cherishes, nourishes a children. And then he also uses the illustration of a father that he is a father in spiritual leadership that has spiritual interest at heart not only the tenderness of a mother the, not only the gentleness of a mother or the selflessness of a mother the godliness of a mother but then he also adds the influence of a father the impartation of a father the instruction of a father, the encouragement of a father and the training consistent training of a father that he gave to these Thessalonian believers. And this is spiritually indispensable, which means it is very necessary if we're going to be the kind of people, the kind of members, the kind of children of God that we ought to be. The Thessalonian church did not trifle, did not play, did not gamble, did not joke with the word of God. What the privilege and the opportunity that they had for growth they received the word. They believed the word and they followed the Lord and they followed leadership. And we have the same privilege here. The word of God is preached to us week after week by our leaders. And as we have the privilege, we'll not gamble with our privilege. 
will not joke with her privilege. Will follow like the Thessalonian believers followed in Jesus' name. We're dividing the, three, the study to three parts today. Number one, practical righteousness before God and perceptive witnesses. These witnesses were not children, they were not babies that didn't know their left from their right. They were perceptive. They knew when things go wrong. They would know if Paul the apostle was not living right, Paul the apostle could not cajole them, deceive them, and you know, throw the blanket over them. They knew when things were not all right, and they knew when things were all right. And we need to be such perceptive witnesses too that we look at the lives of the people that are ministering to us, and it's not just what they say, and it's not just how they say it, and it's not just the charisma. And it's not just a gift, it's a life. Holy and just, irreproachable and unblameable. Point number one, practical righteousness before God and perceptive witnesses. Number two, pastoral responsibility for a God-pleasing work. Pastoral responsibilities. Paul the apostle was a pastor. He had the responsibility over the people. And then Silas and Timothy shared with him in that pastoral work, pastoral ministry, they shared with him and they led the people to please the Lord. Number three, perpetual requirement. There's a requirement that is not just for that time. It's for the present days, perpetual, until the Lord will come as long as the church continues on earth. Perpetual requirement of a gracious, worthy work. We're coming to point number one. Point number one, we're looking at practical righteousness before God and perceptive witnesses. We're looking at First Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 10. Yeah, witnesses and God also are holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. The believers who observe these ministers, Paul, Silas, and Timothy, they observe them closely. They could testify to their exemplary character. Can they testify like that about you? You're a worker in the church, a soul winner, or just, or just a Christian. If you're a real Christian, the people in your place of work, the people in your community, the people that go in and out with you and the people that see your life every day, can they say that you have a worthy example like Paul, like Silas, like Timothy? Your wife, can, he, can she testify about you like that? Your husband, can he testify about you like that? Your children that see you, they see you at, you know, at the relaxing moment. They see you when you are very busy. They see you when you are relaxing. They see you at every, every time. Can they testify about you? Because Paul, the apostle said, Ye are witnesses. All those of you that have been with us, that have observed our lives, that have seen everything that we do, and we're living together, and we're related together, and we fellowship together, ye are witnesses. Is your life such an example? And can you face to face, eyeball to eyeball, talk to the people that know you and say, ye are witnesses, how holily and justly and unblameably I behave myself among you as a person living with me or living around me. God also was a witness that they were holy and sanctified. He was a witness that they were just and upright, that they were blameless and irreproachable. Their holy lives made their message effective that their ministry had a transforming effect in the hearers. If your life is not holy, whatever you preach, anybody can know the doctrine. If you have been with the people of God for five years, for ten years, or have been with the people of God for about twenty years, you might know the Bible from cover to cover. It may be in your head, but we're interested in knowing is it in your heart? Is it in your life? Have you been transformed? Anybody can teach. There are some people that have the natural beauty and the aptitude to teach and to string the verses together and to say, thus says the Lord. Anybody can do that, but the life. And Paul, the apostle said, we present to you not just the bare letter of the word. We present you the letter and the life. The scripture and the spirit. And you can see that our lives were just. Our lives were holy. 
Our lives were unblameable. The same grace that produced godliness and holiness in Paul the Apostle and his partners and those Thessalonians, he can do the same for us. He will do it in Jesus' name. I said he will do it in Jesus' name. Oh, why don't you look at 2 Timothy chapter 3 and see what Paul the Apostle said. He wasn't only really saying that to the Thessalonians. He said it to Timothy too. 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 10. But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience. Was right into Timothy. He said, Timothy, of course, you've been very near. You've been very close. I wasn't living a secretive life. A life that Timothy, you know, Paul, Paul is an apostle, all alone by himself. Don't go near. Don't see what he does. So that you'll not see some secret things that young people should not say. I said, no, open the door. Be transparent. Let everybody know that grace can make us a transformed man, a transformed member, a transformed minister. He said, Timothy, you know. And you are fully known, not only my doctrine, but my manner of life, and purpose of life, and my faith, and long-suffering, and charity, and patience. Obviously, Paul, the apostle, was not a person that was you know, locking the door against himself, about himself, around himself. You cannot enter. If you are going to enter, you know, there are some people in the family like that. If the wife is going to enter, you must knock the door and then the husband must arrange whatever is there so that the wife will not come in and see the unseeable and see the things that we should not see. Paul the Apostle was not like that. He was open. He was transparent. And you could see, you could tell that this man was a sincere preacher of the word. His manner of life, open. Is demeanor, demand current character and conduct open, transparent to be seen. Look at verse 11. My persecutions and afflictions which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra. What persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. He will deliver us. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse deceiving and being deceived but Paul the apostle was telling Timothy if evil men that have only the evil spirit if they are waxing stronger and stronger in their evil those of us that have the Holy Spirit and the Holy Scriptures we must also work stronger and stronger in the things of the Lord. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of knowing of whom thou hast learned them. I pray that that grace the Lord will give to every one of us in Jesus' name. He lived that life because he was conscious about living a life of Clear conscience before God and before man. Look at Acts of the Apostles, chapter 24. Acts, chapter 24. I'm reading there from verse 16. Acts, chapter 24, verse 16. And herein do I exercise myself. He said, this is my commitment to myself. Do you know there are people that don't have any commitment to themselves? Do you have any commitment to yourself? And say, this is me. Only one life to live. And I'm living for eternity. I'm living with eternity in view. This is what I'm going to do. This is what I'm going to live. I have a commitment to myself. A commitment to God. A commitment to yourself. And of course, a commitment to the congregation. To the people of God. But there are some people, the only commitment they have is a commitment to people. They're not taking care of their spiritual lives. And they don't have any commitment to themselves that come what me. Whether it's only one person or two that will get to heaven, I have a commitment to myself. I must get to heaven. And except you have that commitment with yourself and to yourself, you believe me in a kind of double standard because there's no commitment to yourself. Your commitment is just to the people. Whatever will please the people. If the people, if whatever will please them is that you are drunk and you make a fool of yourself, then you go ahead and do it and please them. But if you have a commitment to yourself and say, heaven, I must be there, I will be there, then that commitment will carry you through. That's why he said in that verse 16, herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense toward God. God, God first, toward God, toward God, and toward, toward who? 
toward men. I pray God will give us such a heart in Jesus' name. We're looking at First Timothy chapter 4, verse 12. First Timothy chapter 4. And we're reading there from verse 12. First Timothy chapter 4, verse 12. Let no man despise thy youth. What Timothy happened to be a youth. If you are not a youth, you're an old man. Let no man despise thy old age. You are not just old, you are not a youth, but you are a woman. Let no man despise thy womanhood. Let no man despise your personality. And if they are not going to despise your personality, what are you going to do but be thou an example? Paul the Apostle said, I'm an example, we are, an, we are examples unto you. And then he says, for every Christian, every believer like Timothy, you have a commitment yourself that will be an example. Be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation. And then he says, in charity, in spirit, in faith, and in purity, till I come, give attendance to reading. Till I come, give attendance to reading. Think about that. Because what you read is the food of the soul. What you read is the food, is the food of your mind. What if you are not eating physically? You'll be lean, you'll be weak, you'll be anemic, you'll be powerless. You'll not be able to do everything you ought to do. What if you are not eating spiritually? What if you are not reading? What if all you do is just come to the Bible study? And then after the Bible study, you're not even reading over what you have heard. You might be anemic spiritually and weak spiritually without strength spiritually. And not able to have the real stamina, the backbone. When temptations come and when the waves and the winds blow upon your life. But you say, give attendance to reading. That's the food of your soul. The food of your spirit. That's the strength of the spiritual life. Read your Bible. And read all this literature that we have from our life prayers. And listen to all these messages we have from the life tapes that will say that I'm feeding my soul every time. Some people, it's only Sunday and Monday and Thursday. What if you only ate on Sunday and on Monday and on Thursday? How strong will you be? Take this spiritual food. Read the word. Meditate upon the word. Practice the word. Believe the word and stand upon the word. It says you give attendance to reading, exhorted to exhortation and to doctrine. And neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by the by prophecy with the laying on of hands of the hands of the presbytery. Meditate upon these things. That's how we digest what we read, what we hear, what we learn. What if you just eat and then go to the toilet and pour everything out? You don't digest it. It doesn't benefit your system. Meditate upon them, the word of God that we're hearing. And question yourself on every line, on every paragraph, every verse that we read. Have I experienced that? Am I holy? Am I just? Am I unblameable? Do I have a good example? Am I having this good responsibility? Do I have a good commitment to myself? Am I living the life that will carry me to heaven? Should that have to take place anytime? Am I ready? That's how to meditate upon the word. When you examine the word, ruminate upon the word, meditate upon the word, apply the word to your life. Meditate upon these things and give thyself wholly, completely unto them. That thy profiting may appear unto all. Take heed unto thyself and to the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that do what? I hear the, I'll not listen to a preacher that is not very seriously reading the word of God, meditating upon the word of God. It's not even serious about saving himself. It's not even serious about committing himself to his own salvation and to his own getting to heaven. And a person that is careless about getting to heaven himself, how can I trust my soul into the hand of such an individual? It says, it's when you commit yourself to all these things, you'll both save yourself and them that hear thee. How can this happen? How can we live like Paul the Apostle, like Timothy, like Silas, and then be somebody whose life has been transformed? And then we'll be able to say with other people, yeah, witnesses how justly and unblameably and how holily we lived among you. Here is this. It's on the outline there, number one. Present your body 
every day to the Lord as a living sacrifice. Wake up in the morning and say, Lord, my hand, my feet, my head, my eyes, every part of my body will be to the glory of your name today. And then remember that during the day that that was a commitment in the morning. Number two, spend much time meditating on the word of God. How shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word? Number three, pray to be kept from sin. Listen to this and pray that the temptation to sin and the opportunity to sin may never coincide. You know, sometimes there's temptation to sin, but there's no opportunity to sin. That's good. And sometimes the opportunity to sin is there, but the temptation to sin is not there. You're just plastic, normal, like stone. Nothing happening to you. The opportunity to sin is there, but you don't have the desire, the temptation. But when the temptation to sin is there, and the opportunity to sin is there, and they coincide together, that's very dangerous. And so you are praying that, oh Lord, even though the temptation will come, I'm praying that the temptation to sin and the opportunity to sin will not come at the same time. Number four, control your thoughts. Be very careful what you feed on. Pornography, questionable, immoral places that open doors to sinning, moral failure. Avoid that. Number five, be occupied with Christ constantly. Looking on him by faith for purity, for protection, and for preservation. Number six, always remember that your body, your mind, your talent, your money, your possessions are not your own. To do whatever you want with them, you are to glorify God. God in your body and your spirit which belong to God. Come back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. I'm looking at verse, verse 10 again. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. We're looking at verse 10. It says, Ye are witnesses and God also. Have you noticed what Paul the Apostle was emphasizing there? If he had said, Ye are witnesses, how holily and justly and unblameably will behave themselves among you that believe. I said, That's nothing. That's nothing. How much will I know? I may even follow you around. I may see your character. I may see the outward shell. I may see the outward profession. How do I know your thoughts? How do I know your mind? How do I know your disposition? How do I know your, your planning? How do I know the goal you have in your heart? But you said, and God also. We need to learn from that. All men may praise us. It's nothing. Because the testimony of man without the testimony of God is worthless. It's useless. We cannot say because all men, they know that I'm holy. All men, they know I'm just. All men, they know I'm, I'm kind of unblameable. That's not sufficient. That's not enough. God must also be able to bear witness about you, about me, about us, that we're holy, we're just, we're unblameable. I want to show you what Jesus himself said. Look at Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16. I'm reading from verse 15. The testimony of men. That's nothing. The praise of man, that's nothing. That I sin is a good man, that's nothing. A righteous man, that's nothing. That man is saved and sanctified. Who says that? Man, that's nothing until God bears witness as well. I'm looking at Luke chapter 16, verse 15. He said unto them, Ye are they which justify yourselves before men. But God knows your hearts. You justify yourself before me. Look at my life. What have I done? Look at my life. I'm holy. I'm just. I'm unblameable. But it says, God knows your heart. For that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. There are people that are abominable in the sight of God. And yet, before men, they are pure right. They are pure holy. They are pure just. They are pure unblameable. That's why Paul the Apostle said, you're not only the, they are not the only witnesses. What do they know? They were new converts. What did they know? About the depths of the things of God. About spirituality. They were just new converts. If he had said, ye are witnesses. If he had not said, and God also. It will not have been complete. Let me show you something in the Bible. We're looking at 4 Samuel chapter 27. 4 Samuel chapter 27. And I, I want to show you that the testimony of any man, any man about you is nothing. Sometimes they think you are good or you are bad. 
They think you are righteous when you are unrighteous. They think you are holy when you are unholy. And so don't just say, everybody can testify about me. My wife knows how just, how holy, how blameable I am. What does your wife know? My husband knows how just, how holy, how blameable I am. What does your husband know? The members of the church, they know me. How holily and justly, unblameably I behave myself among them. What do we know about you? Nothing. The real sin, your heart. Only God knows. That's why Paul the Apostle said, Ye are witnesses, and God also. How holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. Look at this illustration. We're looking at for Samuel chapter 27. I'm reading verse 2. For Samuel chapter 27 verse 2. And David arose and passed over with 600 men that were with him unto Achish, the son of milk, king of Gath. Look at verse 3. And David dwelt with Achish at Gath, he and his men. David dwelt with Achish. Look at verse 5. In verse 5, And David said unto Achish, If I have not found grace in thine eyes, let them give me a place in some town in the country, that I may dwell there. For why should thy servant dwell in the royal city with thee? Verse 6, Then Achish gave him Ziklag that day. Wherefore Ziklag pertaineth unto the kings of Judah unto this day. Verse 7, And the time that David dwelt in the country of the Philistines was a full year and four months. How long did David stay there? Tell me out loud. One year and four months. Look at this now. And David and his men went up and invaded the Geshurites and the Gezrites. And the Amalekites and those nations who of all the inhabitants of the land, as thou goest to shore, even unto the land of Egypt. And David, what's the next word? Tell me out loud. And David smote the land and let neither man nor woman alive. Is that good or bad? Is that cruel or kind? Tell me. Is that righteous or unrighteous? Is that just or unjust? Is that unblameable or blameworthy? Blameworthy. Look at this, verse 9. And David smote the land and left neither man nor woman. Allah did it offend him. They were not prepared for war. He just went there and destroyed all of them and took away the sheep and the oxen and the asses and the camels and the apparel and returned and came to Achish. And Achish said, Whither have ye been? Have ye made a road today? And David said, Against the south of Judah. And against the south of Jeremelites, and against the south of the Kenites. And David saved neither man nor woman alive to bring tidings to Gaz. He left nobody alive that will be able to tell any story about him. That will be able to say, hey, look at what David has done. He destroyed everybody, killed everybody just to cover up. I want to show you something now. Look at this in chapter 29. Chapter 29. I'm reading from verse 6. Chapter 29, verse 6. Then Achish called David and said unto him, Surely, as the Lord liveth, thou hast been upright, and thy going out and thy coming in with me in the host is good in my sight. That's a testimony. The witness of man. Look at this David. Achish knew nothing. David had killed everybody there. But he killed everybody that nobody will remain alive to tell the story. A bad man at that time. Or righteous at that time. Evil at that time. Wicked at that time. Unkind at that time. But he left nobody alive to tell the story. And Achish was totally ignorant. That's what I'm, that's what I'm telling you. What do men know about you? 
the things we do in secret. I will not leave anybody with threatening everybody that will tell the story. Silence everybody that will tell the story. And David did not leave anybody alive to tell the story that this is what he had done. And so Aki said, in my sight, you're a good man. In my sight, you are upright. For I have not found evil in thee since the day of thy coming unto me unto this day. Nevertheless, the Lord favor thee not. In verse 7, wherefore now return and go in peace, and that thou displease not the lords of the Philistines. In verse 8, and David said unto Achish, but what have I done? <laughs> Look at this man. That's what some people do. They know what they have done. They know they are evil. And they still say, I'm holy. And just and unblameable. And I'll say, yes, but I don't think I have the witness in my spirit that you should go with us at this time and be with us at, and serve with us at this time. But what have I done? I don't know. God knows. God knows our hearts. That's why Paul the Apostle said, He are witnesses and God also. Except God can bear witness, the witness of man is nothing. Look at that verse again, and David said unto Achish, But what have I done, and what hast thou found in thy servant so long as I, as I have been with thee unto this day, that I may not go to fight against the enemies of my lord the king? Look at verse 9. And Achish answered and said unto David, I know, I know, I know that thou art, thou art good in my sight. Tell me the next thing. Say this man, I know you are good. You are beyond the goodness of a human being. You are like an angel of God. Testimony of man, nothing. God must be a witness. We can easily be deceived. And people think you are saved. Only God knows and you know as well. When the Spirit of God bears witness in your heart. And then he said, I know that thou art good in my sight as an angel of God. Notwithstanding the princes of the Philistines have said, he shall not go up with us to the battle. The emphasis I'm making with you and with myself with the church is that live a life that God can testify about. So that you can say like Paul the Apostle, ye are witnesses and God also. How holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe I go to point number two now. In point number two, we're looking at the pastoral responsibility for, for a God pleasing work. Pastoral responsibility for a God pleasing work. We're looking at First Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. First Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. As she you know. And we exalted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father does his children. He exalted them. He challenged them. He charged them. He taught them. Having lived a righteous life, a holy life, a sanctified life before them, these ministers, that is Paul and Silas and Timothy now, they made an earnest solemn appeal pressing upon them the importance of living holily and justly and unblameably before God and also before man. That is the reason we did that and the reason we lived a transparent life, a righteous life, a holy life, a just life, an unblameable life. It's not just to live in isolation and say, see how we can be. We can be like Enoch. No, we're not. It's not that pride. It is to be like that. to live an example for you and say, see what the grace of God has done and see what the transforming power of the gospel has done in our lives so that you too, you'll be able to follow the same example as a father having the best interests of his children at heart. So they exalted and charged them, those Thessalonians that they might be partakers of God's holiness as a concerned father, desirous of seeing all his children in heaven. They touched them, they trained them, they counseled them, they demonstrated and exalted and encouraged and guided and inspired them in the way of holiness. What did they want them to do? That they would walk worthy of God and have that who has called them into the kingdom and to glory. A child walks worthy of the father when, number one, he lives in such a way as to reflect his honor. When you are conscious of the glory of God every time, 
of the honor of the Lord every time. You're not conscious of yourself, self-will, personal ambition, personal promotion, personal desires. All you are conscious about is the glory of God and the honor of God. And you want to please God. That's how to walk worthy of God. Number two, it is when he lives as never to pain the heart of his father by misconduct. When you are conscious that, well, daddy will not like this. I mean, our heavenly daddy, our father in heaven, he will not like this one. And because this will cause pain, agony, anguish, heartache in the heart of our father in heaven, I cannot do this. And because of that commitment, that's how we glorify the Father, and that is how we walk worthy of Him. Number three, it is when you understand that you are to give no occasion to anyone to speak reproachfully of the Lord. That if I do that, they'll say, There you are, Deepa Life, there you are, Christian, there you are, child of God, there you are, saint, holy, holy people. And because you don't want them to speak reproachfully, you say, no, I cannot do that. I will not do that. To walk worthy of God. We live like Christ, the worthy son, number one, by keeping the Father's commandment from his sincere, honest heart. Number two, by living a life of transparent purity and heavenly virtue. Number three, by honoring the Father's will above our desires, above our personal opinions. Number four, by upholding his standard and making it our principle for living. Number five, by denying ourselves to bring glory to God, whatever the cost may be. Number six, by walking for the increase of his kingdom while we decrease in our personal ambition. And number seven, by teaching others to honor him who has bestowed such grace upon us, upon our lives. Look at Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 3, and you'll see why Paul the apostle, as a pastor, as a leader, as a minister, as a teacher, why he lived the kind of life that he lived. And you'll see the example he has left for you and for me, for us all together, that we live such a life too. Jeremiah chapter 3 and verse 15. Jeremiah chapter 3, we're looking at verse 15. And I will give you pastors according to my heart. Can you give me a good amen there? Yeah. There are pastors that are not according to God's heart. I pray God will never give us such a pastor. The pastors who are only appointed by men. The pastors who are only in that position by politics. By running down other people to exalt themselves. By pushing down other people to take their place. There are some pastors who are there. God has not sent them. God has not appointed them. God has not given them to the church. But God said, I'm going to give you pastors. And if it's a pastor I give, he'll be according to my heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and with understanding. If God gives us any pastor at all, any leader at all, any coordinator at all, any group coordinator at all, any overseer at all, any teacher, in any way, any time, any section leader, if it's God that gave him to us, he'll feed us with knowledge and he'll feed us with understanding. Look at verse 17. At that time, when God has given us such a pastor, such a leader, at that time, they shall call Jerusalem the throne of the Lord and all the nations shall be gathered unto it to the Name of the Lord to Jerusalem, neither shall they walk any more after the imagination of their evil heart. When God gives us a real teacher, a real minister, a real apostle, a real pastor, he'll teach us in such a way that he'll get us away, divorced and separated and severed from our evil way. I'm looking at Jeremiah chapter 23 verse 4. Jeremiah chapter 23 verse 4. And I will set up shepherds over them. I will set up shepherds over them. We don't get, become shepherds by campaigning, by political maneuvering. We allow God to do it. We we'll ruin the church. We we'll destroy the church. When we appoint leaders, ministers, pastors through politics, power play. Violence, campaigning, 
maneuvering, remote control. He must be there. He must do it. And we don't allow God to appoint the shepherds. But when God appoints a shepherd, you can tell in the lives of the people, it will reflect in the lives of the people. I will set up shepherds over them, which shall feed them, and they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed, neither shall they be lacking, says the Lord. When God appoints a leader, that's what happens. And we're told in Acts of the Apostles, Acts of the Apostles chapter 20, Acts of the Apostles chapter 20, I'm reading from verse 28, Acts of the Apostles chapter 20, let God appoint. And when he appoints, you'll fulfill the responsibility. And when God appoints you, you're not trying to keep the position by any political maneuvering. You're not trying to keep the position. What you get by faith, you're not trying to keep by force. You know, the people that have, they have left the path of faith. And the Bible says, whatsoever is not of faith is what? Tell me out loud. It's sin. Whatever you get by faith, you keep it by faith. What you get by faith, you cannot keep it by force. Because whatsoever is not of faith is sin. And if God has appointed you to be a pastor, to be a leader, to be a, to be a kind of forerunner before the people, to lead them into the things of God, you need to appoint yourself. And if God says, this is where to be, praise the Lord, that's where to be. This is what to do, praise the Lord, that's what to do. Rather than, you know, political maneuvering, campaigning, vote for me, vote for me, how to be this, how to be that. You don't do any good in the kingdom of God if anybody votes for you. What do they know about you? They may seek you an angel, like Achish said about David. Angel before men, devil at heart before God. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 20, verse 28. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock. Over the which, tell me the next words. The Holy Ghost has made you overseers, not campaign, not politics, not people, not men, not women, not your friends. The Holy Ghost has made you overseers. And the rest of us in the congregation, how we ought to be careful, how we ought to be careful. All these recommendations that we're making and we're saying that person can do this. How do you know? You might just be an achish. That fellow is clever. And he kills all the men, all the women, and all the children there. That nobody will be able to come from that place to come and tell any story about him. And then this achish is coming and says, this man is a good man. He's an angel of God. How do you know? Let God be a witness. And let God put the person there. And when God puts the person there, he'll fulfill the pastoral responsibility that will make us, the congregation, to walk in the way of the Lord. You will not be playing politics. Look at verse 28 again. Take it to us. Therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock, over the which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. And when he's done that, then he'll minister to us. The pastor will minister to the church to make the life of the church holy and just and unblameable. We're looking at First John chapter 2. First John chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 3. First John chapter 2, verse 3. It says, Hereby know we, hereby do we know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. He that says, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar. And the truth is not in him. But whoso keepeth his word in him, verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. He that says he abideth in him, ought to do what? Ought himself also to, to walk, even as, as he walked. That's the evidence of knowing the Lord. That's the evidence of following the Lord. And I pray that that same grace the Lord will give to every one of us in Jesus' name. Welcome to point number three now. Perpetual requirement of a gracious, worthy work. Perpetual requirement 
of a gracious, worthy work. As we are following after the Lord as members of the church, he calls us to a worthy work. As we are following the Lord as ministers of the gospel, he calls us also to a worthy work. This is a permanent requirement. It's a kind of perpetual requirement that the Lord requires of everyone that calls himself a child of God. We're coming back to First Thessalonians chapter 2 from verse 10. Yeah, witnesses and God also. You know the importance of those words now. And God also. He must be a witness if it's going to be real, if it's going to be true, if it's going to be anything we can depend upon. Yeah, witnesses and God also. How holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. As you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you. As a father does his children. That ye would walk worthy of God who has called you unto this, unto his kingdom and glory. In all aspects of Christian living and calling and ministry. It is required of ministers and of children of God that we should walk worthy and walk as he walked. We should always pray, Lord, make us more like Christ and less like ourselves. Oh, Lord, make me more like yourself and less like myself. The things you brought into the kingdom. You know, when you came into the kingdom, you had some habits you had developed. You brought it in the kingdom with you. Yes, you are born again. But, you know, your sleeping habit, your eating habit, your talking habit, your intonation, and your good grammar, and your bad grammar, and your good interpersonal relationship, and your lousy interpersonal relationship, and your moody look, and your long face, and your cheerful look, and anxiety. You brought everything to the kingdom. Your sins were forgiven, but your peculiarities, your idiosyncrasies, they were still there. You brought them into the kingdom. That's why you ought to be praying every time, oh Lord, make me more like yourself every day and less than myself, less like myself. There is no higher goal and no lofty ambition than to be Christ-like. God's great purpose in redemption is to conform all who are saved to the image of his son. Conformity to the image of his son that is to the lord jesus christ is not an in external religious ceremonies it is in the beauty of the renewed mind and the holiness of life and the holiness of heart that brings us to the central question what is jesus like and how can i be more like him how can i so live like all that others will see christ in me and see christ through me number one we must be saved a sinner cannot live like a saint a sinner cannot live like jesus christ not only that we must receive him into our hearts and allow him to live his life from the central throne of our hearts we must say, Lord, take over my life my thoughts the direction of my life take over everything i just want to live to please you and you alone and then not only that we must become partakers of that divine nature partakers of his holiness and let the mind of christ be in us and then we'll be able to live like Christ. His mind was always to unpleasing the father not unpleasing himself we notice the lord jesus christ how he lived pleasing the lord every time pleasing the father who has called him every time look at john chapter chapter 6 John chapter 6 I'm reading from verse 38 John chapter 6 we're looking at verse 38 the commitment that Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior made to himself with himself and the commitment you need to make with yourself and to yourself it says in John chapter 6 verse 38 for I came down from heaven not to do my own will but the will of him that sent me that was his heart to glorify the Lord every time. Look at John chapter 8. John chapter 8 verses 28 and 29. It says, Then said Jesus unto them, When ye have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall ye know that I am he, and that I 
do nothing of myself. But as my father has taught me, I speak these things. Look at verse 29. And he that sent me is with me, watching me, looking at me, examining everything I do, and looking at all the details and all the shades and colors of everything I do. The father has not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him. That was his commitment. That will be your commitment. Look at John chapter 4 verse 34. John chapter 4 verse 34. Jesus says unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. No personal agenda. No personal goal. No personal ambition. No political maneuvering. Nothing. Just to do the will of the Father. To please the Father. And that's what the Lord is calling you to, calling me to. We're looking at John chapter 12, verse 49, verse 50. John chapter 12, verse 49 and verse 50. It says in verse 49, For I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me, he gave me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his commandment is life everlasting. Whatsoever I speak, therefore, even as the Father said unto me, so I speak. His mind was just to glorify the Father, just to, just to finish the work the Father had given him to do. Chapter 17, verse 4. John chapter 17, we're looking at verse 4. I have glorified thee on the earth. Every step of the way, I've glorified thee on the earth. Every day that I spent here on earth, I've glorified thee on the earth. When the Pharisees were there, I glorified thee on the earth. And when my disciples were there, I glorified thee on the earth. Were the saints, were the sinners, in and out. Even when the world was watching and looking, I've glorified thee on the earth. Every moment of my life, I have glorified thee on the earth. Isn't that a commitment that you'll be conscious of that every time? That wherever you are, in the church or outside the church, at home or in the office, in the marketplace, on the street, when you are by yourself all alone, or you are with other people, when you are thinking, what should I do? What should I not do? Every time that you will be able to say every moment of the time, I am glorifying God on the earth. A commitment you make to God. A commitment you make to Christ who so has shed his blood for you and purchased you with his precious blood who oh, went through that agony and suffering for you. And then you say, if he gave his life for me and did that for me, the rest of my life, every moment, every minute, my commitment to God to myself is that I will glorify the Father here on earth. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work. Have you started? If you have not started, how can you finish? The work he has given you to do. The life he wanted you to live. The way he wanted you to exalt the name of the Lord. Have you even started? I have finished the work that thou givest me to do. What a great commitment. Let's look at John chapter 18 verse 36. John chapter 18. Verse 36. In verse 36, it says, Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. Oh, praise the Lord. I said, Praise the Lord. You know, as the you know, campaign is almost going to heat up very soon, and people are running up and down. They want to be this in the local government, they want to be this in the state, they want to be this in the nation. And there's some, some Christians. The evangelism the Lord has given us, they abandon. The word he has given us to preach, they abandon. Everything he wants us to do for the eternal destiny of millions of souls, they abandon. And they're running the rat race with politicians. But the Lord Jesus Christ knew his calling. I pray that we all know our calling. And as a church, deeper like Bible church, to know the calling that has given us. Honestly, contending for the faith once delivered unto the saints. That you don't allow whatever agenda, the ecumenical church, the big church has, whatever agenda they have, that we don't allow that to sway us. And we know that we are to follow Christ and whatever Christ wants is what we want. And he said, my kingdom is not of this world. 
if my kingdom were of this world, then it says my servants will fight. It says that I should be delivered, I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from this. Then verse 37. And Pilate therefore said unto him, Are thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou seest that I am a king. To this end was I born. And for this purpose, for this cause, came I into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. That's the purpose. That's the goal. That's the desire. That's the passion. And that is the commitment he made to God the Father and he made to himself. And the same way Jesus walked is the same way we're going to walk. I said the same way he walked, we're going to walk. Look at First John chapter 2, verse 6 again. You see how Jesus did it and you see what he did? His commitment was to please the Father in everything, every way, every day. Every moment, every minute. And that's the commitment we are to have to. First John chapter 2 verse 6. He that says he abideth in him ought himself also so to walk, even as he walked. Can I tell you something about the Lord Jesus Christ? And you translate that to your life, number one. He lived to please the Father and not himself. Number two, he lived to please the Father and not his friends. Number three, he lived to please the Father and not his persecutors. Number four, he lived to please the Father and not the world. Number five, he lived to please the Father and not men in general. And that's the life, what we live. That's what the Lord requires of every man, every woman, everybody in the kingdom, every minister. As we endeavor to follow the Lord, and then you say, This is a perpetual requirement, permanent requirement to live a gracious life that is worthy of emulation, that is worthy of pleasing the Lord. Number one, he lived to please the Father and not himself. We're looking at Romans chapter 15, verse 3. Romans chapter 15, and we're looking at verse 3. Romans chapter 15, verse 3. For even Christ pleased not himself. For even Christ pleased not himself. Do you ever think about that as you are following Christ, that you are not to please yourself? What you want? What you desire? What will make you happy? It's better to be holy than to be happy. What will make you fulfilled? It's better to fulfill the will of God than to fulfill your own desires. The Lord Jesus Christ lived to please the Father, not to please himself. Number two, he lived to please the Father and not his friends. We're looking at Mark. Mark chapter 3. In Mark chapter 3, we're looking at verse 20 and verse 21. You know, the temptation to please your friends. We love you when you do what we told you to do, what we want you to do, whether it's wrong or right. That's how you keep your friends. That's how you keep friendly. But if you keep, if you are so fanatical about the Bible, and you are so straightforward about the Bible, every dot and every jot and every title, you want to follow that. You are not even thinking about us only Bible, Bible every time. How are we going to be friends? And because of that, you yield to the pressure of fulfilling the will of your friends. But it's the Lord Jesus Christ lived to please the Father, not his friends. I want you to look at Mark chapter 3. Verses 20 and 21. And Mark chapter 3. Mark chapter 3. Verses 20 and 21. And the multitude come together again. So that he could not so much as eat bread. And when his friends heard of it. They went out to lay hold on him. For they said. What? Tell me again. Oh, this is too much. This is too much. He's beside himself. He wasn't pleasing them. They were not happy with him. If everybody is happy with you, I doubt whether you're a child of God. 
If everybody is saying, well done. We love that. He's a good man. He's a great man. Akish saying, David was a good man, like an angel of God. After he has killed those people with, with devilish cruelty. Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6. And I'm reading from verse 26. Want you when all men shall speak well of you. If you're living to please men, living to please your friends, you're not thinking about God. All you want to do is for people to smile at you and to say, it's a good man, it's a good woman, it's doing well. Want to you, when all men shall speak well of you, for so did they, their fathers, to the prophets. Number three, Jesus lived to please the Father and not to please his persecutors. You know, to avoid persecution, do what your persecutors want. You know, to get off from pain, do what the people who are causing you pain, what they want you to do. Be their servant. Be their slave. See, I have heard. I've learned my lesson. This is what you want me to do. That I will do. Whether it pleases God or not, I see that you are powerful. I see that if somebody goes against your will, you know how to torture somebody, how to torment So I'm sorry. I'm going to please you. There will be no more persecution. But Jesus Christ did not please his persecutors to be able to avoid persecution. We're talking about getting to heaven. And those persecutors, they're not thinking about heaven. They're not thinking about getting you to heaven. They want you to miss heaven. And if you want to get to heaven, you'll never want to please your persecutors. You'll say, do whatever you can do. That's part of my cross, and I'll bear it joyfully. And I pray God will give you grace to bear your, at your cross cheerfully in Jesus' name. John chapter 7. John chapter 7, verse 24. John chapter 7, verse 24. Judge not according to appearance, but judge righteous judgment. Then said some of them of Jerusalem, Is not this he whom they seek to kill? But lo, he speaketh boldly, and they say nothing unto him. Do the rulers know indeed that this is the very Christ? He didn't please those persecutors. And the people wondered, look at this man speaking boldly. Doesn't he know they want to kill him? And yet he spoke boldly. That same boldness God will give you. Did I hear your amen? amen? And he did not live to please the world. The world is in the bosom of the devil. Pleasing the world is pleasing the devil. In John chapter 15. John chapter 15 verse 18 verse 19. If the world hates you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. If you are of the world, the world will love its own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. And then number five, he did not please men in general. You will not please wicked men. I said you will not please wicked men. Like Lord Jesus and like Paul the Apostle, like all the faithful of old, we will please the Lord. I said we will please the Lord. The grace to please the Lord. The unction to please the Lord. The anointing to please the Lord. The power to please the Lord. The confidence, the, the conquering spirit to please the Lord. The Lord will give to every one of us in Jesus' name. First Thessalonians chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 4. First Thessalonians chapter 2. We're looking at verse 4. But as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak not as pleasing men. In your life, make that your commitment. Make that your commitment. You came into this world all alone. All the people you know now, you didn't know them the day you were born. They didn't know you the day you were born. You have struggled in your life. You have heard the gospel. You have repented. And you have come into the kingdom of God. And when you are making the consecrations and suffering. Suffering for righteousness. All the people you know. You didn't know them at that time. How were you allowed the people that just came yesterday? 
and the people that just knew you a few months, a few years ago, then derail you and cancel, destroy all the consecrations you made since you knew the Lord. And the Lord who has carried you and conducted you to this point, then you turn your back on him. And Paul the apostle said, I know all you Thessalonians on the day when I was going to Damascus, none of you was there. When I was tricking to the ground, none of you was there. When I became blind, none of you was there. When I was three days and three nights praying until I received my sight, none of you was there. And then when the Lord gave me the commission, none of you was there. How now will I now abandon that God who has seen me up to this point to please you? He said, no way. He said, we're not about pleasing men, but God. God, which tries our hearts. I pray it will give you that commitment. We're looking at Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 10. Galatians chapter 1, looking at verse 10. For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet pleased men, I should not be the servant of God. If all your life you wake up in the morning and then you're so afraid, you're so timid, you're so frightened, these people are going to, you know, challenge me today, confront me today. I hope I'll be able to please them so that they'll not cause me trouble. You lose your ministry, you lose your life, and you lose everything that you've got. You'll not be a servant of, my, of God. You'll be a servant of men. But if you say, Lord, give me the grace today, to show that salvation, to show that sanctification, and to show that holiness without which no man shall save the Lord and let me live a God pleasing life today. Whatever may happen, then you remain a child of God and when the trumpet shall sound and the dead in Christ shall rise up and we which are alive shall be caught up together with them so as ever to be with the Lord you will be among the number when the saints go marching in in Jesus name. Pleasing God all your life and not trying to please men. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer that God will give you the grace. God will give us the grace all together. Pleasing God and not pleasing men. Pleasing God and not pleasing men. Rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. The Lord has shown us today what the Christian life is all about. And how we ought to live to the glory of God. Not going through life panicking. Going through life fearful. Going through life slave of men. Going through life servants of men. Going through life under pressure to please man and woman. Going through life not conscious about the presence of God. And all you are conscious about is friends, foes, persecutors, men, the world. Become God conscious. Are you born again? Are you saved? Are you following after the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? Open your mouth and talk to the Lord in prayer. Check up your Christian life again. Born again? You have repented? Turned around? Transformed? Washed in the blood of the Lamb? Cleansed, living holily and justly and unblameably. When we are there, when we are not there, does the conscience bear witness that your life is transparently holy? Does your conscience bear bear witness that you're living a just life. Don't worry about the testimony of Akish about you. Saying that you're a great man, a good man, a godly man, a gracious man. What does Akish know? Saying that you're just like an angel of God. What does Akish know about you? Nothing. Can God bear witness to your life that you are righteous, that you are pure, that you are just, that you are holy, that you are irreproachable, 
that you are unblameable. Who are you following? The Thessalonian believers knew who to follow. Who are you following? Are you following Christ? Are you following real Christ-like leaders, ministers, pastors? Or you look for these uh, deliverance ministers? A lot of noise. No virtue. No holiness. No stability of character. Noise. External religion. Knowing what purity. Who are you following? Know the people you follow. Their faith. Their faithfulness. Know the people you follow. Their just life. Their holy life. Their unblameable life. Know the people you follow. The people who are committed to Christ. Committed to the scriptures. And reproduce the life you follow. Reproduce the holiness. Reproduce their just lives. Reproduce the irreproachable, unblameable lives. Have the same grace in your life they have in their lives. And live to the glory of God. And live in godliness. So that you, you'll be able to say, your neighbors are witnesses, and God also, how holily and justly and unblameably you have behaved yourself in your community, in your place of work, in your school. A dignified child of God, a disciplined child of God, a dedicated, devoted child of God, holy, righteous, just, unblameable, irreproachable. Live a life that is glorifying unto the Lord. If God has chosen you to be a leader, a minister, a teacher, an evangelist, a soul winner, a worker, a laborer in the vineyard of the Lord, be faithful unto the Lord. What he gave you by faith, you keep by faith, not by force. You keep by faith and faithfulness. For the Lord give you by faith, you preserve it by faith. Not by political maneuvering, not by violent action. Not by forgetting yourself. Not living an unrighteous life, hypocritical life. Just to keep a position in the church. And if God has raised you up as a leader, a minister, a teacher, among the people of God, you'll feed them with knowledge, with understanding. And the people that you lead will become more righteous, more just, 
irreproachable, holy. What's your influence over the people you lead? Are you teaching them to be hypocritical? To be deceptive? To be unholy? They were serious before you became their leader. Saved, spiritual, sanctified before you became their leader. What's the impact of your leadership over them? Are you making them now hypocritical? Deceptive? Violent? Wicked? Unkind? Cruel? What kind of influence or impact do you have on the people you lead? Paul the Apostle said, we exalted you. We comforted you. We charged you. That you walk worthy. Are you charging the people that follow you, the people you lead, that they'll walk worthy to please God, not to please you? Not to please themselves. Not to please friends. Not to please persecutors. Are you teaching them? Not to please the world. Are you teaching them? Not to please men in general, but to please the Lord. The people you lead, they become more spiritual since you started leading them? Or do they become more careless? Serious about material things? Serious about the work? Serious about how to deliver? But careless about their spiritual lives? What kind of leadership impact influence do you have over the people you lead? This is a perpetual requirement, permanent requirement for every member in the kingdom of God, every member of the living church. That those around you will be able to bear witness. And God will be able to bear witness. How holily and justly and unblameably you behave yourself among the believers. Show evidence of salvation. Show evidence of spirituality. Show evidence of sanctification. Following peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Show that evidence. And show that you have a commitment to God and a commitment to yourself. That you live to please God. A commitment to God and a commitment to yourself. That come what may, you'll get to heaven. That you'll preserve this holy life. That will preserve this righteous life. That will preserve this gracious, glorious, godly life. Until the very end. While iniquity is abounding and the love of many works in cold. That you will preserve 
a life of grace, a life of godliness, a life of virtue and glory until the end. That every time, every moment, with clear conscience and with no pretense, you'll be able to say the people around you are witnesses and God also are holily and justly and unblameably. You behave yourself among them that believe. 